to me is Abdul Latif, will be our timekeeper. This debate is part of Division 1. What you are about to watch is a style of debate which encourages a high level of exchange and engagement between the two teams. Each speaker will have six minutes to make their speech. After one minute, the timekeeper will signal once like this. After this sound, the debaters on the other team may offer points of information to the speaker. Debaters must stand up when they offer points of information. The speaker holding the floor may choose to accept or decline a point when it is offered. At the five minute mark, the timekeeper will signal once, like this. After this sound, no more points of information may be offered for the rest of the speech. At the six minute mark, the timekeeper will make a double signal, like this. After this sound, the speaker must conclude within a few seconds. After the six minute speeches, each team have the opportunity to make a three minute reply speech. This can be made by either the first or second speaker on the team. No points of information are allowed during reply speeches. The opposition will make their reply speech first. The semi-final round of the Singapore Secondary Schools Debating Championship is a short preparation round. The two teams you'll be watching tonight were given the motion for the debate only one hour ago. Before the debate begins, the audience are reminded to switch off all handphones, pages and anything else which might disturb the debaters. Should you need to exit or re-enter the room for any reason during the debate, please wait until the end of the speech to do so. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce the adjudicators for this evening's debate. They are Mr. Joshua Lo, Ms. Wynn Chen, and Ms. Na Min. In proposition for this evening's debate, we have Raffles Institution. Their first speaker is Harry Kope. Their second speaker is Samuel Lowe. And their third speaker is Joel Lee. Samuel Lowe will be doing the reply speech. And in opposition this evening, we have Singapore Chinese Girls School. Their first speaker is Audrey Howe. Their second speaker is Chang Tony. And their third speaker is Annabelle Ahn. Chang Tony will be doing the reply speech. The motion for tonight's debate is This House will ban the advertising of fast food. Without further ado, I invite the first speaker for the, of the proposition to open the debate. Please welcome Hari Kope. What exactly is fast food? Fast food can also be known as junk food, which has, which has been made with the use of excessive preservatives. They often contain high trans fat, high salt content, and excessive amounts of unhealthy cholesterol. These fast foods are incredibly harmful when consumed in excess, leading to cardiovascular diseases, and even in more extreme cases, death. Various distributors of fast food include McDonald's, KFC, and Popeyes. So what do we mean by advertising for fast food? Advertising often means making the product seem attractive so that customers buy these products on a large scale, such as on different mediums, such as TV, radio, etc. Advertisements employ various methods to entice viewers in the first place, such as overhyping the merits of a product and playing down any potential harms of it. Our stance is as such. Fast food is inherently very unhealthy, but we recognize the consumption of fast food is a valid lifestyle choice, as long as the individual is provided with the proper so, information. Advertising distorts this. Therefore, we will ban fast food advertising. So what is our policy to enact such kind of a change? We will ban all advertising of fast food on television, radio broadcasts, newspapers, so, through media authorities. We will inform companies that they no longer can advertise their products in these mediums. Companies found to be breaching such kind of rules will be firstly given warnings, fines, and eventually will have their licenses revoked. We also support all healthcare and healthy lifestyles, such as and promotion of such kind of healthy lifestyles through public service announcements by the government, for instance. So how will we determine what a fast food is? We determine the fast food by crossing a certain limit on sodium, trans fat, and cholesterol content. But this can be determined by various jurisdictions and the relevant metrics they wish to pursue. This is being done around the world by various food regulation authorities. We see parallels of such a policy, such as how no tobacco advertisements are allowed in Singapore, no advertisements for marijuana are allowed in the United States of America. This is a track record for this policy on, on fast food in Finland and Iceland. Opposition has to show us why they will tackle the mass, how they will tackle the massive worldwide obesity epidemic decimating populations globally if they refuse to ban advertising on fast food. <coughs> on our case division, I as the first speaker, we'll be talking about how we protect people and encourage a healthier lifestyle. On the second speaker, we're talking about how this incentivizes the industry to go healthy. 
So on to my first substantive on protecting society. Well, thank you. Fast food is harmful with excessive consumption. This can lead to the clogging up of blood vessels and organ failure. Advertising leads to the excessive consumption of fast food by making fast food seem attractive and appealing to everyone. Advertising influences the thought of the average customer by overhyping the benefits, by making fast food seem appealing, by making burgers and fries seem succulent and delicious. They also overhype the convenience of getting fast food and make it cool and hip when they normalize a culture of fast food in society, where people think to fit in society, I must consume fast food as well. This leads to a massive health risk, as advertising means that so many people are be going to fast food restaurants more frequently and also going there on a daily basis in certain cases. Diseases of the heart and cancer are the top two causes of death in America, constituting 45% of all deaths. Both of them have been proven to have links with fast food in obesity-ridden America. Therefore, we need a total ban on advertisements, as advertisements tend to be manipulated and can find any loopholes easily in regulations, any regulations opposition may try to put forth but to the so table. I'll take in a moment, ma'am, thereby. By removing advertising, we make fast food seem less attractive. Before I move on, yes ma'am. But if you're talking about things like loopholes, wouldn't it be more feasible to just regulate it instead? Ma'am, I just told you that these loopholes exist in the regulations which you try to put forth in the first place. That point makes no sense. For instance, advertising can easily ensure that all farm regulations such as stating how fast food can be unhealthy into smaller fonts while making their benefits into bigger fonts, just to provide an example. All this is very prevalent in countries around the world. Your point doesn't make sense. Fast food can be seen as less attractive because less people see it on a regular basis and is far less normalized in society. This protects society at large, and especially for children who are far more vulnerable to such kind of advertisements, which target them specifically. Thereby, we prevent them being harmed from young in the very first place. In Finland, for example, after a law on fast food advertisements was passed, fast food consumption in major companies like KFC and McDonald's decreased by 53% in a statistic from the World Health Organization, furthering our benefits. We go to my second substantive on encouraging a healthy lifestyle. Our side encourages a healthy lifestyle because fast food companies have huge brand recognition and lots of funding. What this means is that fast food advertisements dominate the airtime on TV and radio, meaning that any normal customer, the moment he switches on his TV or opens his newspaper, is flooded by fast food advertisements. This subverts all other healthier options which may be available for people to pursue in the very first place. By removing such kind of dominating fast food advertisements, Alternatives, such as those provided by the public service announcements, and other healthy alternatives in society are pursued, as fast food doesn't seem so appealing, and other harms of fast food also surface when these advertisements are bad. Thereby, in the long term, we benefit people's health as we, as we encourage them to pursue a healthy lifestyle and go for such kind of healthy alternatives. For example, after the government passed a similar law in Iceland, sales of healthier foods went up by 54%, while sales of fast food declined by a drastic 71%. Fast food isn't finger licking good and people should not be loving it. I thank the first proposition speaker for his speech. And now to open the case for the opposition, I call upon Audrey Howe. Firstly, on their, on their entire idea, how they are solving the problem of you know, obesity, as 
and secondly, on the principal idea about you know the, the um, a corporation's right to advertise and whether the role, the role of the government truly comes to this. So first, on, on health problems, we think that the other side is ultimately proposing a, po a problem solution mismatch, right? <coughs> Why? Because if we look at plastic corporations, a lot of them are multinational corporations. The lure of the product on their side will still exist. We think there's an existing draw of people to fast food already, simply because MNCs are so are so um, influential. They are so they have, they are, their sphere of influence is so wide. They are household names, and so we think that ultimately their law is still, the the law the law of this product will still exist. I think that ultimately in today's society, a critical a critical mass of people who actually oppose fast food has already been reached and will continue Point. to increase, especially given the uh, given advertisements which I'll be leveraging on in my case. We think that ultimately all advertisements are misleading. All advertisements are going to tap on people's vulnerabilities. So we do not think that this, this is exclusive to only um, fast food corporations. We think that their policies are ultimately ineffective and, 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 and unnecessary in, in, in solving obesity. We think that even if we are conceded that the problem does exist, we think that their policy in fact exacerbates the problem of healthcare and obese issues and obesity. Because when we look at health activists, right, see that these advertisements provide a larger target for these companies simply because when you, this, this is where I've, uh, I've, um, I'm bringing in my substantive material, right? We think that ultimately when you look at these advertisements, they're going to be very exaggerated in nature simply because of their profit-driven um, nature of companies, right? I think that ultimately these, these, now these health activists with these advertisements have a larger visceral target in the form of advertising which will ultimately fall at their cost, which, will, which is what my second speaker will be elaborating on. So the role of the government, right, and weighing their rules, right? I think that ultimately, the, they have so they have not proven the direct link, right? But we think, okay, um, I'll, I'll be real my substantive on the role of the government and how this does not come into play. But firstly, on the principle right of corporations, this is my first principle which I'll be following. This directly combats the idea of the principle justification of how they have, but this is um, because this is emotion about weighing, right? They think that ultimately their side is not justified because corporations right. share a social contract with the government because they provide a service for, for the society. They pay taxes and they abide by laws. Following this logic, the government has every incentive to, to not infringe on the right to advertise because they are profit driven in nature. They are going to want to make money and the way they ad the advertising is going to be a necessary channel for them to do so. We think that ultimately there is nothing wrong with this and they have to prove to us why it's so bad, right? But let's look at what, what, is, that, what is the nature of advertising, right? See that when you look at advertisements, they are exa an exaggerated embodiment of fast food. They are physical image and narrative of fast food corporations. Right. Hair in itself, we think that when you allow these aggressive advertisements to exist in the public sphere, they're going to encourage more social societal discourse, which I'll be elaborating on, but before that, yes, sir. Ma'am, if you truly believe that corporations should have rights, would you allow advertising for tobacco companies? Yes, sir, we would allow tobacco advertising, simply because we think that it's more important for society to make uh, an informed decision on their own, to, have, to make the active decision, decision response by themselves, which I'll be elaborating on. You see, that aside proposition's paradigm, the proliferation of information about fast food lies slow, solely in, you know, when the person or the parent is purchasing the product. And we think that this is dangerous, because we think that, that ultimately there's not going to be enough ca uh, counter-narrative to be uh, allowed to, um, to, to flow, which is why we're offering that elaboration, right? I think that advertisement because simply because they're so outrageous and exaggerated, it's going to be easier to raise red, flag, red flags in the parents' mind. Because it's much easier to detect and, and attack these narratives that the, the side of the um, fast food corporations are going to forward. Then that makes it easier for parents to not buy into corporate, um, buy into fast food corporations, um, you know, and hide their advertisements because they're so outrageous. It's going to be more easy to detect that oh, there's something wrong with the products that they are trying to sell me. There's something wrong with the consumption of these products because of the fact that you know they're so aggressively advertising it. It's going to be much obvious. Then that this is healthy. Why? Because we think that outside proposition, their policy is way too paternalistic because it assumes that society cannot discern by themselves you know, what is wrong. Which is why, right, we do not ban the things, things such as video game advertisements, we do not ban things such as gambling advertisements, simply because we assume that society has a, a certain sense of maturity. And when we think that you side proposition is removing the factor from the decision-making calculus, I as a parent, you know, we think that ultimately is healthier because I as a parent, when I see the nutritional value of food, which is supposedly reported by these um, by the um, fast food corporations, right, I'm not going to buy into it because I'm going to be like, these are fast food corporations. Obviously, there's something wrong with what they're trying to tell me, and I'm going to doubt, you know, the, the ethics of what of what they're doing. This ensures that they're making a much more active decision in not purchasing fast food. This is much more powerful because I'm I'm actively deciding not to buy it by myself, rather than the government trying to impose these ideals. And this ultimately builds a very bottom-up approach, whereby you have an active choice, and ultimately this is much more sustainable in ensuring a healthier society. Because I, as a society, make the decision by myself because I understand that the advertisement and there's something wrong with the with the food that they're trying to sell me, right? And the mindset is inculcated in society. 
think that this is the next best thing, because when you have a free market of ideas, you ensure that you know there's a clash in ideas, and my second speaker will be like making one further. This allows for greater maturity and greater sustainability. Because on their side, society does not change the government, we think that it's unsustainable, and as such, walk on the side of opposition. I thank the first opposition speaker for her speech. And now to continue the case for the proposition, I call upon Samuel Lowe. Shanghai are obese, half of all children in New York City are obese, and three quarters of the Raffles debaters do their NAPA test annually. <laughs> <laughs> of this pervading situation, that we cannot allow the proliferation of fast food advertisements. But before we move on to ask these arguments, they have already lost today's debate because the crucial flaws on their case were twofold. What were they? First, they told us about regulations. Hold on a moment, that's a concession. They're agreeing to us that fast food advertising in the status quo today is to some form malicious and harmful to children around us all. But more than just that, it's a contradiction because their first argument was how private companies like fast food companies ought to have the autonomy to sell their products and operate within the free market. In which case, regulations only cut their profits even more. That's why they've already lost the debate. But in any case, regulations on their side only make things far worse. When companies seek to exploit loopholes and thus only subvert a government's power, harming their ability and legitimacy elsewhere. Second crucial flaw. Hold on a moment, man. This is where they talk to us, and I quote them. All advertisements are misleading. Advertisements are outrageous. Advertisements are exaggerated. It's precisely because advertisements are exaggerated, precisely because advertisements thwart your thinking and rational capacity to the extent you cannot make an informed choice that we bear them. They've already lost this debate. Yes, ma'am. On the idea of regulation, our side is saying that we recognize that there are potential harms, which is why the government is stepping in, but not completely infringing on the right of a, of a company, which is what yes, your side is doing. Yes, but you fail to recognize that very often, in order for a company to maximize profits, this comes at the cost of society. That's why we ban things like children like you and me from purchasing alcohol, even though that increases the consumer base of alcohol companies. Thus, governments are legitimate in stepping in to protect people. When your side told us that you will allow companies to expand their profits infinitely, it's a contradiction when your second speaker, or rather your second breath, you told us you would regulate them. Back to our side's case. We have two questions. Firstly, on the role of governments, and secondly, how do we best save people? Because lives are the most important today. First question, on the role of governments. Listen to their first argument. Advertising help companies get profit. Yes, we acknowledge that advertisements help companies get profits, but often this comes at the expense of the people you mislead. That comes at the expense no. of the six-year-old child you try to tell that a Mac Spicy was healthy. We simply cannot allow our rich advertisements to proliferate society. That's why we stood by people making so. informed choices with decisions coming from governments and information being freely accessible. No thank you, man. Second question, on saving people. How do we best save people like you and me in today's society? Here I'll deal with their side's response, but they told us our case was a problem-solution mismatch. And they quoted MNCs, companies with massive influences, like McDonald's, entrenching themselves in society. It is precisely because companies like McDonald's and KFCs can be so freely accessible at Junction 8, with advertisements all around us in Singapore, that we want to change the fact that if entrenched a normalization of norms in society, that will all move towards unhealthy foods like fast food. It's worse on their side, where they compound this effect with their policy of regulations, because in companies like the United States and various Western European states, powerful lobby groups that fund these companies tend to subvert government legislation for themselves. That only makes this entrenchment even worse. The second argument was on the red flag. Their advertisements are so outrageous that they make people fight against them. So for a moment, that sounds rather disingenuous. They're creating a problem to solve the problem. That clearly isn't the point of this, today's debate. On our side, we made it very clear. We'll ban advertisements altogether, setting the problem once and for all. We don't need any more activists to fight advertisements for the sake of fighting advertisements and activism. Next, they talk to us about normalization. Well, it's far worse on their side, where governments are refusing uh, and reluctant to step in and make a change and tell companies they have to change their mentality and people their behaviors. That's why they give us an extremely unhealthy world where your children will become the very victims. 
Next they talk to us about their next argument on a bottom-up approach. Once again, we had a panacea response from their side that we would pursue a bottom-up approach. The problem is, companies like McDonald's are so pervasive in society that a bottom-up approach simply isn't so. feasible anymore. No thank you, man. That's why we need governments to step in and guide us along the correct path. We let them do that for various things. For example, soft drugs and marijuana after yeah. it was legalized in the United States. No thank you. Having dealt with that, why we lost this debate, let's move on to our side's constructive argument that we motivate food companies to market healthier products into the future. Because a ban on advertising fast food incentivizes companies in the future to move towards healthier options. These are companies like Subway and George's Cafe. Because governments today hold the greatest source of public influence in society, by banning fast food advertising, they also send a message to the people, to all of us, that fast food poses harms to health and these harms that we don't necessarily recognize to begin with. People no. like you and me are likely to turn away no thank you man from fast food companies depriving these companies of the consumer base they so desperately require. And because these companies are profit incentivized, when new and upcoming companies see fast food advertising banned and their consumers moving away from fast food to healthier options, these companies follow along, as we saw in Veganburg in Switzerland in 2011. And therefore, in the future, more healthy options become available for people who want to pursue a healthy alternative with a wider range of choices, and not just be limited to McDonald's and KFC because that's all they see on television every day. Why is this significant? Because we pursue long-term and sustainable progress for a culture of healthy food. In the future, who knows? Your children and my children might actually pass on Nakba in a decade's time. Why is this? The case, because after the government banned the advertising of fast food in Denmark in 2009, our best starting food company, Zillion's Bistro, chose to pursue healthier options like salads and organic whole grain bread instead of their original market plan and cost of fast food like McDonald's and KFC. And because of all that reason, we protect both government, society, people, all of us. Colonel Sanders has been lying to all of you. Fast food and fast food advertising are not finger licking good, and we are loving it. I thank the second proposition speaker for his speech. And now to continue the case for the opposition, I call upon Chiang Ko Lin. Advertisements, and you're only going to 
exacerbate the problem further. Because we think that if this is if this is the tenuous link that they're going to draw between solving the problem and removing advertisements, this is not sufficient enough of a link and sufficient enough of a harm and sufficient enough of an effectiveness for them to prove that the state can infringe in the private sphere and remove the rights of corporations to forward their business. This is a right that the state accords to them because there's a contract existing between the state and corporations. Corporations can exist, can be allowed to forward, um, like forward their profit motives if they abide by certain laws. This is when I'm here, and this, not, and this is, I'll be further elaborating on how they actually exacerbate the problem within this guided policy in my case for today. Now you're moving on to the second point of contention about the rights of fast food companies. They obviously have not been listening to our policy. In our paradigm, you won't be able to tell a six-year-old that a McSpicy is healthy because our policy is such that fast food companies cannot make absurd health claims like that. They need to argue in the case in which advertising is properly controlled, in which there is no such thing as by absurd inaccuracies in posters and in advertisements, will you still ban fast food advertising? We say no because we do not think that the existence of a certain unhealthiness in fast food alone warrants an advertising of such food. We bad. There are a lot bad. of things that are bad, inherent, bad ladies and gentlemen, but this does not mean the state will ban advertising of them because we think the state recognizes that fast food companies and all companies, even though their product may have certain aspects which are undesirable about them, that they still exist a legal right to, um, to, uh, to, to forward their profit motive and to forward their abilities, abil abilities as corporations. We think that, the, uh, the, we, but we think that while there are, you know, we, uh, we acknowledge that Man. there are unethical aspects of fast food advertising which do exist, but this can be clamped down without policy. They need to argue in the case of, you know, when, which advertising is properly controlled, will you still ban it? Now, they bring up the whole idea of entrenching MNC's power. We will uh, be elaborating on why this will be further worsened in their paradigm. Now, moving on to my case, but before that, any further of contention. If not, moving on to my case about inhibiting organic change. We think when you state rem the state will actually remove the organic reactionary force coming from the reasonable men, the moderates, and the lobby groups when you remove advertising. This is because with ever advertising effectively is hold on minutes, sir, is a strong narrative of the product and forwarding the you know the most physical embodiment, the ideals of this company. Yes, sir. First you told us advertisements were important to a company and its sales. Next you told us that companies mustn't exaggerate the merits. Do you honestly expect to tell us that McDonald's will tell all of us that it makes spicy 70% oil and 30% salt? Thank you, sir. Obviously, they will not do that. They simply have to abide by, the health uh, by not making um, absurd health claims. But we think that they at least allow um, the right to exist to say, like, buy a Mac spicy, right? That is an inherent right that all corporates exist. You're, you're misrepresenting us. Now, wait, what advertisements effectively are is that they are strong physical embodiment of the ideals that companies represent, including the not so ideal aspects. When you have such, you know, an, um, a, 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 when you have such a, a narrative coming up, it will be met as a natural countervailing and organic response coming from lobbyist groups. This exists in status quo, where such countervailing narratives crop up with the existence of health groups in the USA, with the existence of activists such as Jamie Oliver, who speak up against its fast food companies. We think that this is something that is possible because of the existence of advertisements and a physical target that exists there. There, we think what they do is that they actually um, flag out the perhaps inaccuracies and wrongs of fast food companies because um, it, yeah because uh, but we need to make something clear that we do not think that fast food companies are something that's inherently bad we think that they provide a valid service to society but we think that um with that while there are certain there are certain flaws that do indeed exist what the existence of advertising will do is that it will allow people to flag out these flaws and call out on the wrongs of these companies ultimately this will allow for a better form of organic change in society which will be better in combating the problem of obesity that you talk about because it's a much more sustainable solution than simply removing the surface cause of the problem. What you do is you change mindsets because you encourage an organic movement to spring up against this advertising. This movement has already existed in status quo and this is what we see in the current situation. We think that what happens inside of the proposition is that the lure of fast food will still continue except now there is no more direct form of combating of this problem because people have let the activist groups have less straws to grab onto, less ability to rally support against fast food companies and perhaps the flaws that come with it. Therefore, I'm proud to oppose. Let's go for six minutes and 19 seconds. I thank the second opposition speaker for her speech. And now to continue the case for proposition, proposition I call upon Joanne. I must confess 
I cannot pass my NAPA fitness test. Why? Because the advertising from fast food companies means that I see it as a convenient alternative, meaning that I eat it almost every single day after debates, because I see it as something that I can go to every single day. But before we even go on to prove if they truly believe that companies should be free to do whatever they want if they provide a valid service, then we argue that they will stand for everything and not regulate this at all. But second of all, they already considered, considered and contradicted themselves by telling us in their first speaker, and I quote, advertisements are misleading and manipulative in nature. Clearly, once again, conceding about the massive harms that advertisements cause to people. Secondly, they told us that the entire case was premised only around corporations in this case. Because if you notice very closely to the other side, they never actually talked to us much about how people will benefit, only telling us about corporations. Our response to this is simple right from the very top, and we're going to do away here. We don't really care about the rights of corporations because government's first duty must be to the people first. The only reason why we allow corporations to function and exist is because they provide a service back to the people. If this service harms people, they were legitimate in striking it out. Finally, the entire case pro was premised, no thank you, that on our side the problem will still exist without showing us any immediate harms to the population in any case. So even if our side policy doesn't work, at the worst it's a wash. But if it's going to work and it will, then we win this debate. Two points of contention. First on how we best benefit people, and second on the rights of corporations. First, on people. Opposition's second substantive told us that fast food advertisements will be so outrageous that people will turn away from that. We'd like to point out a contradiction once again here. Why? Because the second speaker then came out and told us and told us that fast food corporations will not be that outrageous. And you can't tell six-year-olds that Mac Spicy's are healthy. Clearly, the type of advertisements they're talking about is not something that they seem to understand. So what exactly are fast food advertisements going to be? We argue that fast food advertisements will be so extraordinarily outrageous because clearly they want to protect their bottom line as well. If it means that they will turn customers away from them, then they obviously aren't going to make it that so outrageous. So we argue two things from this stance. First of all, they're creating a problem to solve it even if these fast food advertisements were incredibly outrageous. But second of all, if the likelihood is that they are not that outrageous, it means that people are likely to be attracted to them, leading to the immense sum which we brought right to you from first speaker and we refuse to stand for this. Finally, they tried to tell us, and the second thing they tried to tell us, rather, was that the problem still exists in our side of the house due to brand recognition. Before we even go on, let us point out that at the very worst on our side, it is a wash and there is no harm done. But why is it then that our side's policy still stands? Because it is precisely because of the immense brand recognition that we must do something to change this. What happens when we cut out advertising? It means that we change the minds of people because we cut out <coughs> the advertisements from bombarding them every single day, effectively reducing the brand advertisement as well. Let's take it one step further and talk about what my first speaker talked to you about, about children. We understand we understand that today fast food advert companies often target their products at children because they want the consumers to latch onto them and think of it as a convenient alternative from a very young age. The moment we cut this off and we cut off this advertising to children, we ensure that in the long term this culture of obesity and fast food can be cut out. That is how we solve the problem on the other side of the house. So yes, it is precisely because fast food advertisements, for rather, fast food companies have such an incredibly strong brand name that we have to cut out the advertising in the first place. Finally, we brought to you two more arguments which they haven't quite talked to us about. First of all, my second speaker talked my first speaker talked to you about promoting a healthier lifestyle because it incentivizes people to go for healthy alternatives. This means that on our side of the house, we seek and actively enable the uh, behavioral change. So they haven't dealt with that, we challenge Nick to deal with that. Our second speaker also told you that how this will ensure long-term healthier lifestyle because it will mean that companies will want to offer healthier alternatives as well. Home moment man, once again, not dealt with. But before I go on, yes. We think that your side is taking a way too alternative approach because you, you recognize that fast companies are always going to exist. So you think that our side is not sustainable because you promote social taking a paternalistic approach. Let's deal with the argument substantive of a bottom-up approach right now. They told us that in order to facilitate organic change, they must create a problem to solve it. Once again, what my second speaker already told you. But we furthermore argue that all these factors against um, fast food companies' influence will already exist on both sides of the house anyway. Jamie Oliver is still going to fight the obesity epi epidemic that exists on our side of the house as well, even if you remove advertising. But the difference is this. His message can get out to so many more people because the airways are not dominated no. by the fast food companies that can advertise with immense brand recognition and the incredible amount of money that they have. 
So it is precisely on our side of the house that organic change should happen most effectively because we ensure the message gets sent out instead of being contradicted with the advertising coming from fast food companies. Therefore, having shown you that we best benefit people on our side of the house, we already take this debate because as I mentioned to you, people must always come first before corporations. Let's further take on the argument about corporations' rights in our second point of contention. They talk to us about the right of uh, corporations. Other than that being a contradiction, we argue that we restrict advertisements and the right of corporations all the time, for instance, in terms like tobacco. But furthermore, on an extension of their logic, we understand that it extends, extends into absurdity. Why? The logic was that if companies give back to the state and pay their taxes, they can sell and do anything they want. By extension, it means that they will stand for the selling of hard drugs and any other illegal product that we stand in the world today already. So no, just because companies can give back to the state doesn't mean that they should be able to do whatever we want, they want rather, we restrict this all the time. Therefore, having shown you that outside best benefits people by ensuring long-term and short-term change, and second of all, we don't really care about the rest of companies because people must always come first. We argue that fast food isn't finger licking good and people shouldn't be loving it. I thank the third proposition speaker for his speech. And now to continue the case for the opposition, I call upon Annabelle Arm.
ladies and gentlemen, we don't believe that we don't believe that their side is even accurate in saying that a top-down approach will lead to behavioural change, right? But saying that we don't want a society that is being led by top-down government policies. Well, there are examples of Finland and the like, which have you no, know, uh, which have such policies actually working in the short term. We don't believe that this will work in the long term in effectively creating a change mindset within the citizens itself. While we believe that the, it, is, it is right that the government has such influence over the people, we believe that in essence, when you have these kinds of advertisements that create uh, they create a sufficient social change within society when you have lobbyists that are actually effectively explaining to the people on the people level, not just the level of the government, or what the harms of eating fast food is, you create a better visceral social change. And we believe that on their side, this is going to be handicapped because what's going to happen is that they haven't really. Uh, what's going to happen is that you're going to have these visceral forms of advertisements which serve as a larger platform <coughs> for these lobbies and uh, for these lobbies to actually act on their situation. And instead, what will happen is that it's going. Uh, instead, what's going to happen is that you're going to have a less effective form of change. Right. But in addition, ladies and gentlemen, we don't believe that in, uh, we don't believe in their point. Now, on our side, we've bottom up situation of things. They've told us that we've just been contradicting our, our, ourselves, but they haven't really been disproving the harm that has uh, the, the, any harm that is coming up in our paradigm. Right. What we're basically saying is that organic change in this case is more sustainable, and everyone agrees with that because when you have a change mindset within Man. the citizens itself, because your lobbyist groups and your uh, and your organisations are actually on a more people level, then what's going to happen is that you're going to have greater social change. Right. But ladies and gentlemen, what they haven't responded to is the fact that these kinds of fast food advertisements, because they're so they're, because they're so called banned in the eyes of society, it brings the situation into a uh, into a better into the front of society and the front of debate. Right. It brings the situation to a point where even the youth are man. of what we're debating now is it really uh, is it really ethical or is it really that uh, or is it really good or bad to eat fast food in extent? So, ladies and gentlemen, we don't actually understand why this is so. Right. But ladies and gentlemen, what they haven't actually been targeting, uh, what, they haven't, what they haven't actually been saying to us today is actually disproving why on our paradigm is going to be first. Because on our paradigm, what we have is a society where your corporations actually have their rights being kept. But at the same time, the, the problem is going to be sufficiently tackled in a way that, uh, that brings a more bottom-up policy. Whereas on their side, what they're going to happen is they're going to actively so-called clamp down on this problem, but it's not going to be effective in the long run because your behavioural things in society haven't been changed. And ladies and gentlemen, your, active, your activist groups won't have a proper uh, won't have a actually big enough or su a substantial rallying point for people to essentially uh, act, uh, uh, actively lobby against the change, right? So ladies and gentlemen, who is really inciting proper change within the society itself? We say that it's our side because it goes on a more people level, but on their side they're just creating paternalistic policies in order to so-called influence people because the government is just that great, right? But we believe that if you look at if you look at the societies that are in, that are in Singapore today, what's going, to have, uh, what's going to happen is that you're going to have the people who aren't really affected by change. So ladies and gentlemen, while we agree that, uh, that fast food is finger licking good and I am Enjoy it and I am loving it. I'm loving it in moderation because I know that it's wrong because I have proper judgment. That's why please don't decide off the opposition. Thank you, third opposition speaker for a speech. In a moment, we'll move to the team's three-minute reply speeches. The opposition will de deliver the, their reply speech first. However, before the reply speeches, we'll now have a two-minute break, during which the speakers can confer their teammates, including their two reserve members. In concluding reply speeches, there are no points of information during reply speeches. After two minutes, the timekeeper will signal once to let the speaker know that they have one minute left. After three minutes, the timekeeper will signal twice. To deliver the opposition's reply speech, I call upon Chiang Ko Lin. The question Sai proposition had to answer today is why there is sufficient social harm caused by not the consumption of fast food, but the exact uh, the, the exact act of advertising of fast food to warrant the state taking away the corporation's rights, despite the fact that corporations opt into a social contract, many other corporations have the same right, and also to warrant the fact that you're going to risk a massive, like, you know, paternalistic approach toward a solution and possibly not allow and inhibit organic change to the solution. We say that side proposition failed in proving this today, and that's why side opposition takes the debate. First of all, the principle that they brought to us was flawed. 
They seem to try and think that some kind of nebulous harm of the major problem of obesity existing alone can warrant taking away the right of corporations to advertise and the act of advertising. We responded to this with the detailed analysis of why the right of corporations should exist because of a certain social contract that it exists because the, because uh, and that the state cannot take away the right to advertise simply by virtue of the fact that the product they're advertising may be unhealthy. The only reason why the state can take away it, uh, take this away is that they are making false and fallacious claims to which we combat it with our policy by saying that we will not allow for such false inaccuracies. This is the main harm and the main problem of advertising that he brought to us, which is the distortion and the fallacious claims made by advertising, to which we consistently responded, which they never dealt with, that it is already tackled in our policy because you simply cannot say a Mac Spicy has got you know, more nutritional value than a salad. This is the kind of rhetoric they've been trying to put to us. They've been dodging the idea that when advertising is ca carried out in a reasonable way and that's legal and you're not making fallacious claims, why is advertising inherently wrong? This is the grounds that they did not respond to and therefore they failed to sufficiently prove the motion. Furthermore, we also said that they are not, uh, their policy is completely ineffective because the harm will not be solved. Because fast food companies are household names, the mindset and perception of people, their attitude towards fast food companies, the attitude of their third speaker towards fast food companies is something that cannot be changed simply by removing advertising. And therefore, because their policy is ineffective, it is not sufficient to remove the right. In addition, they did not respond to any of the harms that we talked about, about exacerbating the problem or the pernicious kind of effect this will have on the organic change of society. To, uh, how did, we brought up the whole idea of how you know, the government will remove the ability of individuals to make active decisions not to consume this food because when parents see an advertisement and decide and consider it in their decision-making calculus that they don't buy the advertisement that doubt starts to creep into their mind, that is when organic change happens. What their side does is they inhibit this. Their main response to this was that the state is the most influential body, therefore they must take their top-down approach in this situation. We think that's untrue because just because there's an urgent problem does not mean that you have to, the state automatically has to take a paternalistic approach. We have to consider this reasonably, ladies and gentlemen. The best way to solve the problem is so deeply entrenched is with organic change, which is inhibited in their paradigm. Because activists now no longer have a rallying point to garner a critical mass of support for their cause against fast food companies because the fast of the advertising exist as a narrative and will be met with an equally strong countervailing narrative that will ultimately allow for more change in society. Therefore, we are proud to oppose. Speakers go for 3 minutes and 19 seconds. And now to conclude the case for the proposition and the debate as a whole, I call upon Samuel Lowe. Obesity is bad, that fast food is bad. The question therefore is how do we stop the fast food and the obesity epidemic from spreading even further? Was it a critical mass? Organic change that they purported? Organic change that could never happen because according to their reality, fast food like McDonald's were becoming household names. KFC was an MNC that was extremely influential, in which case people like you and I found it extremely hard to escape the system that fast food companies have imposed upon us. Organic change was a lie. Or was it the side that brought to you a government ban on advertising? A conclusive stance that went all the way to tell you that fast food was bad and we tried our best to keep our children away from that source of fast food. But before we talk about two issues, their side lost this debate on several grounds. First, from the get-go, their argument that policy of regulation was both a contradiction when they talked to us about companies having the autonomy to exercise their own profiteering and marketing abilities. It was also a concession because they told us, therefore, that advertisements today were pernicious, they were influential, they were bad. No response from their side. Second issue, there was a shrinking characterization of advertisements on their side. Listen to their speakers carefully. First, it was regulated advertisements, in which case, there won't be any critical mass on their own. In their final speaker, their second speaker, advertisements became outrageous, in which case, people were being harmed on their side. Advertisements do not have to be absurd to be misleading. That's something we have to clarify. McDonald's can lie to you without breaking the law. That's something they failed to recognize, and hence there was no response. First issue, on saving people. This was the most important issue in this debate, and so long as we can show you that our side helped more people lead a healthier lifestyle, we won. 
Once again, we protected people and fought the normalization of fast food because we recognized that more advertising, setting in a culture of fast food, would mean that more children, more adults in fact, would access fast food and harm themselves in the long run, especially because they had no information. We encouraged healthier lifestyle and drove people to find other alternatives. We made the industry far more healthy, an argument in my second speaker that we heard no response from, because companies now have an incentive to find other sources. Their case was extremely reductive. In their first speaker, advertisements didn't help our decisions, they helped activism. In their third speaker, advertisements cause um, misinformation, but it isn't the only cause. In which case, we've already seen that their case has shrunk to a concession. And once again, they said that we couldn't make absurd claims in advertisements, which once again contradicts their argument on critical mass in a bottom-up approach. So having dealt with that, then we save more people onto a second issue that their side considered rather important, but truly was rather tangential, on the right of companies. Here there was another contradiction. They told us on one hand that companies like McDonald's should be able to access any consumer base they want, but on the other, they would regulate their advertisements, their fundamental instrument at reaching out to engage you and I. In that case, they clearly harm their own principle. No response. But finally, they brought to us an argument on the social contract. Yes, we admit that a social contract exists, but a social contract also exists between you and the government, and governments must stand by the contract to protect you from the harms of fast food and fast food advertising. That's why fast food advertising is not finger licking good, and we aren't loving it. Please go with the proposition. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, the adjudicators will complete their score sheets and then retire from the room to discuss the debate. They will return shortly to announce the result of the debate. Please stay in this area and do not disturb the adjudicators while they are conferring.